Um, and so I've got a series that I'm going to start. It's going to be three, three parts right now. And um, the series is going to be called Let My People Go. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. If you had to guess, what story is that going to be? Moses, that's one one uh, Bible scholar in the room. I'm going to try one more time. <laughs> the, the, the title of the series is going to be Let My People Go. If you had to guess, whose story is that going to be? Moses. <laughs> it is going to be Moses. We're actually going to look at verse, uh, specifically Exodus chapter 2 and Exodus chapter 3. And I'm not going to get further than that. Because uh, hopefully we're going to dive into some some nuances in those stories, and it'll it, it should be a little bit uh, predictable for you. Um, today I'm going to start that, so we're going to be in Exodus chapter two. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to go ahead and turn uh, to Exodus chapter two, and, and we'll start there. Um, today we're going to look at preparation, and I'm going to charge you with uh, with uh, this phrase: God is working behind. The scenes. Preparation. God is working behind the scenes. That's where we're going to start today. Amen. I'm going to start with a simple illustration. Are you ready? Yes. When I first became a Christian, I got saved at a church in New York City. It was called Brooklyn Tabernacle. Mm -hmm. um, at Brooklyn Tabernacle, the beginning of my walk with the Lord, I was part of the, the sound crew. Mm -hmm. It was the, the team of people that worked sound. Uh, we sat behind a soundboard, and I actually worked the one that was behind the stage. There was another team that worked uh, to make sound for everything that the audience um, uh, heard. Back in those days when I was there, not because of me, it's just because of how God was moving in that church, they started doing their Christmas services and their Easter services. They outgrew kind of the sanctuary they were in. We were already doing three services. So they started to do their Christmas service and their Easter service in bigger venues. So the years that I was there, we did one in Radio City Music Hall. And then we actually outgrew Radio City Music Hall, and then we did did uh, our Christmas and Easter services at Madison Square Garden. Um, so I can I honestly say to you, with all the integrity in my in my heart, that I have been on the stage at Radio City Music Hall and Madison Square Garden. I have been. I've delivered a microphone to the people that were singing. But I walked across the stage. I was on the stage at both Radio City Music Hall. Um, here's what's interesting. As I worked sound and part of the sound crew, I was the main guy. I was a young Christian and had a little bit of a gift, and I was learning. I was training. Um, what happened on that Radio City Music Hall Easter Sunday, Christmas Sunday took months mm -hmm. to prep. The choir worked tirelessly week after week after week for months practicing their parts uh the musicians practice for months and because we're the sound crew you can't really sing without a sound engineer at least not on that big level so we were there every single uh friday when they were practicing if they called a special practice we were there uh, just watching you know make sure that it sounded good and we're watching in those days and again i'm going to name names maybe you don't know any of these people but those were the days they did songs with the gathers and so i mixed sounds for the gathers um, Larnell Harris back in those days, Sandy Patty, uh, that was kind of that album. Um, like, I was part of that. Uh, Michael English, like, long time ago. These, you know, I was part of that. They, they, they came and they, you know, ministered uh, for those songs. I was there for the verses. Mm -hmm. Week after week after week. And then the day of uh, the, the service, we would get there early to Radio City Music Hall, and we would, you know, everybody would kind of line up, and we would run through the entire show before anybody showed up. It's a lot of work behind the scenes. Do you know that that performance, that service, was probably about two hours? It took months for a two-hour service. No one saw the months. They saw the two-hour service. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I'll, I'll give you one more example, uh, just, just so you're tracking with me. Uh, at the school that I'm in, we have we do a chapel service every single week uh, for, the, for the entire high school. And uh, I am one of the adults that oversee the team of students who put together the chapels. So the chapels happen, they're, an hour, they're not even an hour long, they're 45 minutes is what we have uh, for the chapel services. Every week, we meet with a group of students and we work through, here's what the chapel is supposed to look like. Here are the themes that we're going to talk about. Uh, here are the songs that the, we need the music team to come up with, uh, practice for. Here, here's a speaker that we're going to have speak. And, and we're working, we're looking at the cue sheet. Here's how long we have. You know, this is going to be that long. We want to show this video. We need this lighting. And we're working on that week after week after week after week for a 45-minute chapel service. Nobody, except for the 15 kids, are in the planning meetings. Everybody sees the chapel service. Mm -hmm. There is a lot that goes on behind the scenes. And there's a lot of things going on in your life that you just see kind of the performance, so to speak. You don't see what's happening behind the scenes. I submit to you that God is working behind the scenes. The interesting thing about Exodus, the book of Exodus, especially in this first half of the book of Exodus, um, it's about deliverance. And God is going to deliver people. And the first work that you see that he's doing is behind the scenes. Lord, I pray that you'll be with me as I uh, preach this sermon. Lord, I pray that they're not just words to a familiar story, that it's not just fun or funny, but that it's applicable, that you're showing us, myself and the, the people that are listening, your children, that you're at work behind the scenes. God, I pray that you would encourage hearts today. I pray that you would cause us to look a little bit closer about uh, into our situations, our circumstances, to see your hand at work. God, speak through me today. In Jesus' name. Amen. I preached a sermon sort of like this before, not here at other churches. And um, for some reason, a month ago, as I was prepping for this, God dropped this in my spirit. And so I, I, I'm, I'm being obedient. In Exodus chapter 1, we see the children of Israel finding themselves, they're under affliction by Egyptians. Right. Egyptian leaders, they're now um, slaves. They're enslaved in a land that's not their home. Things are really, really difficult. And they're in the midst of 400 years in Egypt. Mm -hmm. They're in the middle of that. Um, it's not the life that they designed for themselves. It's probably fairly new for most of them, many of them. It's definitely uncomfortable for them. They're living in an existence of, 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 um, of oppression. They're there. In the midst, though, God is doing something that they don't necessarily expect. Like, I would submit to you, after 400 years in Egypt, they don't expect what God's about to do. We're going to look at the first piece, and I think you'll, you'll track with me. The first piece of this is deliverance sometimes shows up in the ordinary. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now a man from the family of Levi married a Levite woman. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with asphalt and pitch. She placed a child in it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. Then his sister stood at a distance in order to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter went down to bathe at the Nile while her servant girls walked along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds. She sent her slave girl, took it, opened it, and saw him, the child, and there he was, a little boy, mm -hmm. crying. She felt sorry for him, and she said, this is one of the Hebrew boys. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, should I go and call a Hebrew woman who is nursing to nurse the boy for you? Go, Pharaoh's daughter told him. So the girl went, called the boy's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child, nurse him for me, and I will pay your wages. Oh, wow. So the woman took the boy and nursed him. 
And when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she became her son. She, Pharaoh's daughter, named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. We're going to pause there. Deliverance sometimes shows up in the ordinary. The child was put in a basket, an ark, at three months old. Now, I'm looking around this, around this room, and I am making an assumption, and I apologize for making this assumption. If I offend you, uh, please forgive me. I don't know you beyond the weeks that I come here and fill in, but I am guessing there is none of you in this room that currently have a three-month-old baby. Am I okay to say that? <laughs> yeah. Including myself. So here's what I did. I went online and I printed out what happens, uh, you know, at three months for a baby. Because we might have forgotten. So at three months, a baby can raise uh, the, their head and their chest while laying on a stomach. Mm -hmm. They can start to lift the, their head up. Uh, they can support their upper body with their arms while they're laying on the stomach. So they can kind of start to you know, maybe lean or something like that. Did you know this? Anybody forget? Yeah, it's three months. Um, they can open and shut their hands. Aww. Like, let me see you. In, in this room, you're going to open and shut your hand. <laughs> see, that's not impressive to me. <laughs> but a three-month-old, that's so cute. Right? I did. Uh, let's see. They can bring their hand to their mouth. Let me see you do that. Can you bring your hand? <laughs> see, that's not impressive. I'm not impressed. But a three month old, it's like, oh wow. <laughs> right? Three months. Uh, they can grasp and shake uh, hand toys. So you can put a little rattle, they can hold on to it, kind of. And they won't let go of it at three yeah. months. I don't know why they're so strong. You ever try and take a rattle from a. Like, you can't do it. I don't know what it is. Uh, they can watch a face intently to mm. so stare at you. Yeah. Uh, they'll follow moving objects. Right, so if you go like that, they'll kind of smile and do that at three months. Uh, it says that they recognize familiar objects and familiar people at some sort of a distance. So they'll recognize, you know, mom or dad. Um, let's see. They start using hands and eyes. And oh, they'll smile. Everybody smile for me. Come on, smile. <laughs> Beautiful smiles. It's not as impressive as a three-month-old does it, though, right? That three-month smiles. Three months. Uh, they begin to babble. Come on, let me hear you babble. Oh, okay. my gosh, yeah. Half of them, they're not going to do it. They're not going to babble for me. At three, if you're three months old, you babble, and it'd be impressive. Three months. Think about it. At three months, with all these little milestones, this mom says, I don't want this kid to die. And so she does this, the unthinkable. She puts this baby in an ark, a small ark basket, and puts him in the water of the Nile wow. to save his life. Yeah. After all these milestones that she's, her heart's warming up, and she says, this is going to be better for this child. Puts him in the water. Notice the daughter of Pharaoh, she sees the basket, she gets it drawn, brought to her, she opens it up and she sees the boy crying. Mm -hmm. Says so she's moved with compassion. She takes that child to be his own, her own. Mm -hmm. Interesting, very, very ordinary. Um, this is not supernatural in the way it looks. She sees a baby. She's got a choice. I can either throw this baby in the water, which is what the, the, the command from the Pharaoh is, or I can have compassion on this child. She has compassion on this child. The child is cared for by his mother. Right, that's pretty cool. But she, he remains a part of the Pharaoh's household. So he grows up. You know, under that. Um, other than this unique circumstances, did you notice that these things are fairly normal? They're fairly ordinary? Do, do you get what I'm saying? Uh, the, this, the birth mother says, I, I can't really raise this child. It's unsafe. It's like if you can imagine a teenage girl who has a baby then she's like, I, I just can't care for this baby. And she says, the better thing for this baby is to put him or her up for adoption. Mm -hmm. That happens. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what, what, what this 
birth mother says, I can't care for this baby. The better thing for this baby is to put him out there and hope that maybe God will lead him to uh, someone. The, the mother, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's daughter, looks at this baby and has compassion. It's like a grandparent whose, whose children cannot care for their children. And that grandparent says, I don't want this child to end up in foster care somewhere. I, I love this kid. I'll take that child in my home and I'll raise that child myself. It's kind of Pharaoh's daughter. She sees this baby. She just has compassion. I'll raise this child myself. These are really ordinary things. You know, if you take out the, you know, the, the, the we don't understand this kind of life, but, but these are decisions that are made by ordinary people saying, this is how I can care best for this child. Do you see that? Do you see that? For them, it's very, very ordinary decisions, but God is at work behind the scenes. God's doing some things that they don't even realize. They're just worrying about what to do with this baby. God's at work behind the scenes. Exodus chapter 2, we're going to keep going. Go ahead and look down. We're looking at verse 11 through verse 14. We're going to work our way through the entire chapter. We'll, we'll get done on time. Verse 11, years later, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people. He observed their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian striking a Hebrew one of his people. Looking all around, seeing no one, he struck the Egyptian dead. He hid him in the sand. The next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you attacking your neighbor? Well, who made you commander and judge over us? The man replied, are you planning to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses became afraid and thought, what did I, what I did is certainly known. Pause there for a second. You know, there is nothing in the text that tells us when Moses understood that he was a Hebrew. Whether you look at Acts chapter 7 or you look at Hebrews 11, which also recounts uh, this, this, this moment, never tells us when he knows. Maybe his birth mother told him when he was in her house and she was, you know, taking care of him. So maybe he grew up all the time knowing. Maybe his adoptive mother, for lack of a better term, mentioned it to him. Maybe Moses looked and said, you know what? I don't look like the rest of the Egyptian people. History says that the Egyptian uh, people's uh, skin color would have been a little bit darker than his. So maybe he looked and said, well, I, don't, I don't look like everybody. You know, there's some certain culture that they just have certain facial features just because of their culture. And maybe he looked and said, I, I just don't look like everybody else. And maybe at some point, Pharaoh's daughter said, that's because you're a Hebrew. The Ten Commandments shows it as, you know, he's an adult, and it, it's a shock to him. He finds out, I don't know, Bible doesn't say that. It makes for a great story, but we don't know that. But what we do know is at some point, he goes out to his people, and he sees his people being mistreated. In fact, he sees an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew, and he stands in the way. He stands in the way. Could this have reasonably been the first time he ever saw a Hebrew mistreated? Probably not. He's probably seen it before. This is probably not a surprise. So why did he step in this time? Why was it this moment? Why not before? What was so special about this guy, this interaction? I'm not going to respond because that is the right answer, but i got to build up the drama here. <laughs> he defends the Hebrew. He kills the Egyptian. He later steps between two uh, Hebrews that are fighting each other. There's, there's something in him that's saying, i, I got to do something here. There's something in him that says, I need to show compassion here. I, I've got to help here. And I don't know what it is, but something in him just woke up and said, i got to do something. Because at some moment, he notices the injustice. He notices the problem. Probably for years before, he didn't notice it. It happened, I saw it, but he didn't notice it. You know how you can see something but not notice it? And I would bet you that there are things that, that, that happen in society or in your world that each one of you notice. 
And I would bet that there's some things that some of you do not notice. Mm -hmm. You see it, but you don't notice it. Mm -hmm. There are things that God lays on your heart that he may not lay on your neighbor's heart. For example, um, any of you really care about issues regarding like animals, like animal rights or anything? Anybody? Anybody care? Got it? Mm -hmm. Got it? See? Any of you care about uh, like the earth? Global things uh, in, in matter to some of you. Uh, and, and I want you to raise your hand. Any of you um, things that have to do with uh, youth? Anybody like you care about you? You're passionate about young people. Yeah. Got it, yeah. um, how about elderly? Those that are old. Anybody have a, your, your heart goes out to? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, How about like church stuff? You really care about church, like you know ministry or things that that matters to you? Raise your hand. Here's what's happening, and you don't see it because you're all looking at me, but I'm looking at different hands going for different things. And it's not that you don't see everything. You see it all, but you don't notice everything because not everything matters to every person. But there are some things that matter to some people that may not matter to other people. And God is really unique in that he determined to make his presence known in the earth through his people. He is determined to act in the earth through his people. He doesn't send down angels to kind of take care of everything. He invests that or entrusts that to you and me. So there's some things that you're going to notice that somebody else might not notice. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't care. It's just it's not their passion. It's not their burden. It's yours. Mm -hmm. I tell my students, uh, especially my seniors, as they're going into the, into the world now, I say, listen, stop asking, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Change that question. Ask it this way. God, why are you showing that to me? Why am I noticing that? God, oh, why is it happening? I, I don't know. I can't answer. What, why am I noticing this issue? Maybe there's something that God wants you to do. Maybe God's working behind the scenes, placing a burden on your heart because he wants you to speak, do, act. I don't know why, but in this moment, Moses notices this Hebrew being beat by an Egyptian. And he steps in. He shows compassion. He gets involved. One thing that we as Christians have the benefit of doing is we have the benefit of going to God and saying, God, why? Mm -hmm. Why am I seeing this? Lord, what do you want me to do? People of the world don't have that. They, they don't do that. They, they just kind of wing it. Not saying that God doesn't use people who don't know him. God uses people who don't know him. He uses Pharaoh, but Pharaoh's not leaning on, on, on God. He's not leaning on wisdom for God. So, so he, he, the way that he processes what's going on, plagues and all those things, are different, but God uses it. But for the believer, we can actually lean on God and say, Lord, show me, reveal to me by your Holy Spirit. Why is this sticking out to me? Is there something you want me to do in this moment? I think that's what's happening here to Moses. Moses is sensing there's something that I'm supposed to be doing. And so he steps in the minute, kills an Egyptian, not the right thing to do. But he's saying, I, I feel like there's something I'm supposed to do, but I don't have clarity. But I want to help. I don't know what to do. I'm going to keep going. Uh, verse uh, 14, 15. I'm going to finish this. When Pharaoh heard about this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh, went to live in the land of Midian, and sat down by a well. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water. They filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then some shepherds arrived and drove them away. But Moses came to their rescue, watered their flock. When they returned to their father well, he asked, why have you come back so quickly? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. So where is he? He asked his daughters. Why then did you leave the man behind? Invite him to eat dinner. Moses agreed to stay with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. She gave birth to a son whom he named Gershom, and uh, for he said, I have been a resident alien in a foreign land. Verse 23. After a long time. How long? A long time. It's a long time. The 
king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor and they cried out and their cry for help uh, because of the difficult labor ascended to God. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the Israelites and God was concerned about them. By the time we get to verse 23, 40 years have passed. We find that in Acts chapter 7. 40 years had passed from the last thing I read. 40 years earlier, Moses delivers one Hebrew from one Egyptian. It's kind of a failed attempt. Doesn't really turn out well. Soon in Exodus 3, Moses will be sent to Egypt to deliver all the Hebrews from all the Egyptians. It's coming. Verse 23, it says, after a long time, the ESV says, during those many days, your King James says, in the process of time, your NIV, if you have NIV, says, during that long period, we know that to be 40 years, the cry of the people came to God. Do you think the people ever cried out to God before? What do you think? Sure, offense. Probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. 400 years of this. Several hundred years enslaved. At least 40 years between Moses' birth and this moment here. I would think that they cried out to God before. Mm -hmm. I would think that they cried out to God quite a bit. There is something about oppression, challenges, difficult times that cause us to seek out God and cry out to God. God, help God. There's something about these moments that cause us to turn our eyes and our attention to God. Amen. What they cry. We have no record of what their cry was. Like we don't know. We know they cried out. I have no clue what they cried. Did they say, God, get us out of Egypt? They'd grown up there. Mm -hmm. Might not have asked that. Did they say, God, overthrow those oppressors. Get rid of them. Or maybe they said, God, just help us. We're tired of this. Change our circumstance. Have no clue what their cry was. Have no clue what the, the people cry, but they did. And the Bible says God heard their cry and he revisited, remember, he revisited his covenant. God looked upon the people. He turned his eye, his attention, his heart toward the desire of the people. Why didn't he do anything before? They probably cried out before. Why didn't he do anything before? He could have. Have you ever asked God that question? God, why didn't you? I have. God, why didn't you stop that, change that, fix that? But God, why did that happen? Why? 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 Why didn't he do anything before? Was the demonic interference where, where somehow he, he, he was prohibited? Maybe something else had to take place for deliverance to happen in a long-lasting way. Maybe if he would have answered their cry 200 years before, they might have been free, but then they might have been recaptured and it would have gone south. But maybe he said, no, that's not the time. In 400 years, I'm just thinking about it, different leaders would be in place in different regions in the area. In 400 years, certain roads would have been established, certain things would have been built. <clears throat> they would have made certain paths easier for the Israelites to travel on 400 years. <clears throat> in 400 years, certain wealth would have been attained that would not have been there 400 years prior. In 400 years, and specifically in 40 years, certain individuals would have been alive that would not have been there 40 years earlier, or 400 years earlier, or 200 years earlier, or 100 years earlier. Certain people who needed to be on the earth at that point were not there before. Think about this. To them, 
the Hebrews, nothing changed. You ever think about that? We're reading the Bible. We're reading, you know, chapter one, chapter two. We're reading it like a story. The person that's living it, to them, nothing looks different. For them, nothing looks different 40 years ago to today. We cried then, we're crying now. Our ancestors cried before. Our forefathers cried before. We're crying now. To them, nothing looks different. But God is at work behind the scenes. Sometimes for you, you're looking at your situation and it doesn't look like it's changing. You're asking stuff, you're praying for things, you feel like there's no answer, but you don't realize that God is at work behind the scenes. Sometimes we can get caught off, caught off guard just looking at what is. We're looking at what's on the stage. Right now, I appreciate your attention. I, it's, I, I appreciate it. I love the fact that you're listening. Um, none of you, tell me, maybe you were, I don't know, I'm assuming, none of you were looking in my window yesterday or the day before or the day before that when I was preparing, were you? No. I tell my kids all the time at school, it looks like I'm winging it. I'm a professional. But for me to make my classroom feel like it's just flowing it takes a lot of time behind the scenes. It takes study and prayer and research, and fixing things, and changing things. There's a whole lot that goes on behind the scenes to make what you see in front of the scene make sense. Theologically, this is a picture of God's providence and God's sovereignty. God who's overseeing what's happening. God who's sovereign, who can make sure that his will, his plan is played out. But he interacts with humans' will. Your free will. Mm -hmm. I can't explain to you exactly how he makes all that work, but somehow he sovereignly makes sure things work according to his plan, but he allows us to function within our human free will mm -hmm. to make sure that what he wants done gets done. For you, sometimes it feels like things are moving little by little. Things are not changing. But God say, you know, I'm working some things behind the scene that you can't see yet. For him, he says, I'm preparing a deliverer. And it's taking some time to make sure that things are right where they need to be so that I can do what needs to be done. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to somebody here. I'm ho I hope someone here has been asking God why and God is saying to you, I'm working behind the scenes. Don't fret by what you see. I'm working behind the scenes. I'm going to close with the, these, these words here. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 5. Uh, I love these words. Paul writes this. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. When the fullness of time was come, he sent his son. He could have sent Jesus at any time in history. But there was a time that God knew, this is when I'm going to step into yes. human humanity. Amen. Amen. This is the time I'm going to do it. And when that time came, God sent his son. Amen. Just like Moses. Probably could have sent the deliverer 200 years before. But when the time had come, he sent that deliverer. I don't know what's going on in your life, but yet God could change a whole bunch of things. He could change it like this. But when the fullness of time comes, he steps in to make sure that his plan is played out Amen. in your life. Amen. That's true. Amen. Sometimes we find ourselves in circumstances and it seems like God is silent. No, he's not silent. He's working behind the scenes. I'm going to end with this thought. I, I meant to ask my girls if I could say this. Uh, my girls, they have been involved in musical theater at our school, and a couple of them have been on the stage, and one of them has worked behind the scenes, kind of helping with sets and things like that. They, for them to do a musical on the high school or middle school level, it takes months after months after months. Those kids are designing sets and building sets and making props and painting things and then they're practicing over and they're moving things and removing things and figuring out lighting. It's an amazing thing. It takes months for a show that lasts 90 minutes. They're 90 of the best minutes you'll ever have. They do a great job. Those 90 minutes take how many hundreds of hours 
There's so many people. There are some things that you're going to see happen. And for those little moments that happen that you get a glimpse of, God has been working behind the scenes to prepare a place for you. If you know Jesus, you can depend on his plan and you can see it work. You can identify it. If you don't know Jesus, you're just kind of winging it. You're just seeing stuff happen, but you don't really, you, you can't really put the two and two together. I implore you, know Jesus. Get to know the God whose hand is over all things, who's working behind your scenes, who has your good at heart, who's working all things together. We're going to see what happens with Moses. You know the story, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper to some of the little things that happen as he's getting his instruction from God. But I'm going to leave you with this. The Lord's at work. And sometimes it doesn't make sense what we see. And sometimes what we see is really nice. But man, God is working on things that are so much bigger. Yes. So much bigger. You can trust Him. Lord, I do thank you for your word. I do thank you for using people like Moses and recording his story in scriptures so that we can learn from it. God, help us to take, take this out of fairy tale world and let us look at this as real people who are going through real things, real instances that are, that are struggling and asking the same questions that we sometimes ask today. Help us to see that you are working behind the scenes for them. You're working behind the scenes for us. I pray for each person in this room. May we trust and depend on you leaning on your everlasting arms. May this week our eyes be open a little bit more to how you're leaning on our hearts, what you're causing us to notice, and how you're working behind the scenes to fulfill your plan in this earth through us. I pray this.